Hey veggie lovers, we're doing something a little special for the end of the year and also to celebrate that Veggie Doctor Radio has had five amazing years. We are doing a countdown of the top five most downloaded episodes of Veggie Doctor Radio. Welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. I am your host, Dr. Yami, board certified pediatrician, certified lifestyle medicine physician, certified health and wellness coach, author, speaker, mother, wife, and human being. I passionately believe in the power of diet, habits, and mindset in sparking and sustaining well being and joy in our lives. This podcast combines expert interviews and thoughtful monologues to explore plant-based nutrition, lifestyle medicine, parenting, mindset, and other exciting and fun topics. I hope that these episodes inspire you, uplift you, and equip you with the knowledge and tools to live your best life. Are you ready to get started? Let's do it. Ironically, the top five most downloaded episodes actually all happened in 2022. So it's been a fantastic year, but we thought that it would be a great way to celebrate five years, also celebrate the last five weeks of the year going into the new year, feel some gratitude for all the wonderful blessings that we've received in this year, but also look forward to the new year. So the number five most downloaded episode of Veggie Doctor Radio is called Weight Stigma is Deadly. And it is a solo episode that I recorded about weight stigma and the different statistics and some of my thoughts on it. It's such a good episode that Switch for Good, which is another amazing podcast that we've done a podcast swap with, also played it on their podcast. So this originally aired March 27th of this year. It played on Switch for Good on November 9th. It is a essential information to know. If you've already listened to it, it's probably worth listening to it again, but it's definitely worth sharing with other people in your life that you feel may benefit from hearing this information. It's so important and it's so important and just so applicable right now in our world. And I'm very, very passionate about it. So thank you so much for making this the number five most downloaded episode of Veggie Doctor Radio. And thank you so much for being here. Let's celebrate the last five weeks of the year. I appreciate you. I'm grateful for you. If you are a longtime listener, thank you. You're the core of why we keep doing this. If you're a new listener, welcome, come on in. I hope that you enjoy it here and learn a lot. So without further ado, let's listen to this episode, the number five most downloaded episode on Veggie Doctor Radio, episode 200, Weight Stigma is Deadly. I wanna thank you for being here, for being a loyal listener but also to all the new veggie lovers, welcome. I am so happy to have you. Thank you for being here. This is why I'm here, because of you. And I know you're listening because we are now at over 613,000 downloads. Yay. I can't wait till we make it to a million. I'm gonna have to do like a big giveaway of some sort. So thank you. I know that you're listening. I appreciate you. Thank you for writing into the show. Yami at dryami.com. If if there's something that you want me to answer on the show, a special guest you want me to have, I welcome it. So thank you. If you want to give me a little gift for the 200th episode, can you please share this with two people in your life? You don't have to share this specific episode, share your favorite episode, or just share the podcast with them. I would love that so much. If you could spread Veggie Doctor Radio love around, we can get more listeners and get this message out to even more people around the world. So I have to admit that the 200th episode just kind of snuck up on me. We have been back to interviewing guests and it's been going great. I am spending more time in the office and I'm able to fit in my weekly guest interviews and it's been going well. So we're on a little routine and it's been good. It's been flowing, but the 200th episode 
suddenly came up and I'm just like, I want to do something special. And I realized that what feels special to me right now is sharing with you my passion. So I was recently asked to consult with a very progressive organization that wanted to learn more about weight stigma and weight bias and how they can reduce this as they move forward in their important work. And the reason they found me is because maybe about a year-ish ago, Jasmine Singer asked me my opinions and I was quoted in an article that she wrote in Veg News Magazine. And I'll make sure that we link it in the show notes so you can read that article as well. But basically it was about fat phobia in the vegan community and sizeism and all of that. So they saw me on that article and then reached out to me. And it really gave me an opportunity to dive deeper into these topics and wow, I've learned so much, so much. I still have a lot to learn, but I am fired up. So this is a special episode and it's coming from my heart, but it's not particularly cheerful. So I'm sorry about that. This episode is going to be informational. It's going to be educational, but it's likely going to bring up some discomfort and perhaps even some anger, some sadness. What I don't intend is for this to to cause you to feel shame of course i can't control whether you feel shame or not but this is not the intention of this episode i want you to leave the episode feeling empowered ready to raise your level of awareness around weight bias and weight stigma and start applying some of the tips i have at the end I will also be doing a follow-up episode where I discuss healthism, health at every size, and other issues related to body size obsession. It's going to be a few episodes down the road because I do have some guest interviews lined up beforehand, but I promise I will be back with more and more resources. But before I move on to discuss this topic, I also want to let you in on some exciting news. For a limited time, I am opening up slots for one-on-one health and wellness coaching. So that means that I will be working directly one-on-one with clients with their health and wellness goals. So I'm a national board certified health and wellness coach. I do spend the majority of my time in the office seeing my little kiddos, which I love them very much, and doing doctor stuff, but I love working with clients on their health and wellness goals, so I decided to open up some space in my schedule to do that. Who is this right for? It's particularly right for anybody who is ready to ditch dieting and diet culture, but they're interested in setting and achieving sustainable goals in their life. So I am board certified in lifestyle medicine, but I also have my lifestyle medicine coach certificate. So I am particularly attuned to helping you with goals around nutrition, sleep, stress reduction, joyful movement, anything you feel like you need to move towards the well-being that you desire. So if you're curious about this and you wanna find out more about how we can work together, set up a free discovery call. So it's about 15, 20 minutes. We can talk, we can talk about what you're looking for. You can understand more about what I do, see if we're a good match for each other and then work together. You can go to dryami.com, that's D-O-C-T-O-R-Y-A-M-I.com forward slash coach me. So C-O-A-C-H-M-E. That will be linked in the show notes as well. well. So dryami.com forward slash coach me. I'd love to chat with you to determine if we're a good fit on your health and wellness journey. All right, so let's get started with the episode. But first, I do want to give you a trigger warning. So as I said, it's going to be some uncomfortable topics. I am going to be discussing weight, size, body mass index. We'll be using the word obesity mainly to describe what it means. So this information may be triggering for some people. If you are at a point in your journey that this is not right for you, please stop listening now and come back at a later date where you feel that it might be more appropriate. For everybody else, if you don't, you're not concerned that you're gonna be triggered, just know that you're probably going to feel some cognitive dissonance and uncomfortable feelings. So strap yourself in and let's go. I also wanna give a disclaimer, just, so that you know where I am 
in my journey. So I am at the beginning of this journey of learning more about this top, these topics, how they apply to me, my patients, my clients, all my fellow humans. That being said, I don't identify as a fat activist, a fat liberationist, or a body liberationist, mainly because I don't know enough about those movements, so I can't claim to be one of those advocates at this point. I also don't have the lived experience of living in a body that is considered much larger than average. And I'm aware that I have many layers of privilege And I'm also aware that I have a lot to learn. So I come to you from the perspective of a physician, health and wellness coach, a mother, and a woman of color that has struggled with their own disordered eating and body dissatisfaction for several decades. I'm also aware that we all have implicit implicit biases, which may take some, some time to uncover. And that's where I wanna go next. We are a product of our conditioning. So social conditioning is the sociologic process of training individuals in a society to respond in a manner generally approved by the society in general and peer groups within society. So that means it's our cultural norms, cultural expectations, internalized beliefs, And it usually happens slowly over time. So we're not even aware that we're being conditioned. It includes how you grew up, what your parents told you to believe, how they acted about things. We learned from all of these things, our own experiences with our bodies, our own experiences with our eating and what we perceive around us from society and culture. The... Reality about social conditioning is that it can be so deeply ingrained that it becomes normal and it seems natural and true. It's so ingrained that it just seems like, well, of course, like, yeah, that's the way it is. There's no other way because that belief just gets in so deep within us, especially if we grew up that way. If from when we were teensy, incy, wincy, we were told something over and over and over and over again about how things were or how things are. It just seems like that's the way life is. And for those of us that consider ourselves vegan, you already understand this. You understand that from a young age, we're conditioned to eat animals and told that that's normal and it's good and it's the only way to do things and then one day you realize that that's social conditioning and you come out of that paradigm and you're just like whoa I'm, I'm dizzy my head is spinning I don't know which way is up or down it feels like you just popped out of the matrix well there's all kinds of things we're conditioned about all kinds of things it's not just the food we eat but it's how we look and it definitely includes our body size okay so it takes deliberate work to detangle from our biases and to see things more objectively and honestly i think it's impossible to ever be completely free from bias i guess unless we were a computer but even computers have to be programmed by humans so they you know artificial intelligence probably comes with bias too i don't know i don't work with artificial intelligence, but I'm assuming if it's programmed by a human, it's gonna have some biases in there, you know? So I don't think it's possible to be ever completely free from bias. And hopefully that helps you, you know, feel a little bit more, like you can settle into your body and be like, okay, whew, doesn't mean I'm a bad person. We're all in this together and we'll learn how to try to separate ourselves from bias so that we're at least not causing harm to our fellow humans. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to define a lot of terms and I'm gonna summarize research findings from data that I read and uncovered about weight stigma. And then I'm going to leave you with eight things that you can start doing today, okay? 
So let's start with BMI. You've probably heard of this term, BMI. You, it's probably, I mean, it's in the news, it's in the media, people talk about it, friends and family, they're always talking about it. What is it? So BMI stands for body mass index, and it is a simple calculation. It is a mathematical calculation that is the same for everyone, regardless of age, gender, ethnic group, what part of the world you live in, BMI is calculated exactly the same. So the calculation is weight over height squared. So in the majority of the world, it's calculated kilos over meters squared, but you can also change it to pounds over inches squared. So it was created by Adolf Quetlet. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. I saw two different pronunciations for that last name. I'll just use Quetlet. In 18... 35. So Mr. Adolf Quetlet was an astronomer, a mathematician, and a statistician from Belgium. Okay. Nowhere in that sentence did I say that he was a doctor or even involved in healthcare. And his reason behind creating this index, which he called it something different that I did not write down and I can't remember exactly what he called it, but he didn't call it the body mass index. That name was adopted later. So he created it to attempt to discover statistical laws governing the dimension of the average man. And the reason he wanted to do that is he wanted to gather as much data as he could so that he could determine the characteristics of the quote, ideal man. Man being a key word there because his work was all in men. Of course, it was 1835, okay? So at that point, men were probably seen as superior. I mean, I guess in some cases they still are to women. And so they didn't even study the women. They just studied the men. The men. Believe it or not, his work played a key role in the eugenics movement because he started with this idea of like, how do we determine what are the dimensions? What are the characteristics? What is, if we were going to develop the ideal man, what is this person composed of? And so that's why his work was taken and used by other people in the eugenics movement. He was one of the first to apply statistics to social sciences, and he called it social physics, which is interesting because now we use statistics and social sciences all the time. So it's really interesting how science evolves that, you know, there's people that think of doing things differently. And I'm sure at the time he was like, yeah, this is a great idea. There is an ideal man and let's determine what the ideal man is so that we can all be closer to the ideal man. The reason he did this, created this index is because obviously people come in different heights. So if you're just looking at weight, that's going to get be off. If you're just looking at height, that's going to be off. So he had to create this mathematical index to try to understand the body composition of a person and then put that into a normal curve. Okay. So you are able to take everybody's height divided or weight divided by height squared and then plot it on a normal curve which you've seen you may have heard it called a bell curve and then he can see what the average is in the middle and determine what the ideal man is okay so that was in 1835 and then over time they started applying it to other things and eventually it was adopted in healthcare and medicine one thing that i found interesting is that between 1960 from 1960 to 2002, which we're now 20 years after 2002, believe it or not. I can't believe it. Anyway, so that was still 20 years ago. From 1960 to 2002, the average body weight in men increased by 24 pounds. That is a lot. And height increased by one inch. So that tells you that nutrition changed significantly between 1960 and 2002. And I imagine between 2002 and 2020, it's increased even more. So as you can see, this average BMI has definitely increased over time. But whenever you're plotting out the body mass index of people on a, on a curve, it will never be a perfectly balanced normal curve, meaning that there's not going to be a middle and that there's going to be an even number on the right side, and even number on the left side. It is always going to be skewed to the right. 
So what that means is that there's going to be a bigger tail on the right-hand side of the curve. And the right-hand side of the curve is where the bigger BMI numbers are. The left-hand side of the curve are where the smaller BMI numbers are. So you start in the middle, that's the average mean, the median, and then you go out further and further from the center. And that's where you get people that deviate more from that central average, the median of the curve. So when I read about this in one of the studies, I had never thought about it this way. And it may, you may still not understand it. And it's probably, if you do understand it, maybe you're not going to care, but it blew my mind. Okay. So the reason that the tail on the right will always be bigger, so it'll always go out further than the tail on the left is because below a certain body mass index, you don't have enough fat on your body to survive. So on average, a BMI of less than between 13 and 16, depending if you're a man or a woman, is incompatible with life. Okay, so if you're below a certain number, it's gonna be really hard for you to survive. You're, you don't have enough mass on your body, namely fat, which is our storage organ, to survive. So I find that mind blowing because we're always talking about the people on the right side of the curve and how they're gonna die. Like, you're gonna die, you're gonna die, you're gonna die, you know what I'm saying? But obviously they're surviving because there's a lot of people on the right side of the curve. You know, I'm not saying it's ideal, we're not arguing that right now, but I'm just saying that this is mind blowing to me that I never thought about it that way. That below a certain BMI, your survival is very low, it's incompatible with life but we can have a really high BMI and still live because fat is a storage organ. It's made to help us survive. So that is super interesting to me. And like I said, depending on if you're a man or a woman, that's a BMI of 13 to 16, where essentially you could calculate that they may have like zero body fat. The average runway model has a BMI of 16. Okay. Currently, what I looked up for the average BMI of the average American female in the United States is 27. So in the next podcast, I'm going to talk a lot more about what, how we got to this ideal and what the ideal that we glorify right now. But I just wanted to kind of point that out because that is a huge difference. Runway model 16 on the edge of survival Average female, 27. I love this quote by Leah Guten from one of the references that I use for this, which we will put links to all the references in the show notes in an article called, an article called In BMI We Trust. So they said, a BMI score carries no moral value as from a mathematical and anthropometric perspective, it is simply a ratio of two observable facts about an individual, height and weight, whose population-wide distribution and associations with health outcomes can be reported. I love that. It is simply a ratio of two observable facts whose population-wide distribution and associations with health outcomes can be reported. Associations can be reported two observable facts. Yes, you have a height, you have a weight. That gives you a BMI. We've done studies where BMI is associated with things. Correlation does not necessarily mean causation. I love that quote. Let's move on. So that was BMI. Let's talk about the term obesity. In general, we think of obesity or the thought of obesity in the medical community is having an excess amount of body fat. The way that it is determined for the most part, the majority of the time, is simply from the BMI number. So they will take your BMI number and they will put you in a category and the assumption is if you're in a certain category, you either have normal, low, or high body fat. And it's gone 
to the point, of course, where there's thousands of studies where they've looked at associations between BMI and health outcomes, okay? Just like Leah Guten said, associations can be reported, okay? So what are those cutoffs? So currently in the United States, and these are also the World Health Organization cutoffs, but not every country or every group or population has the exact same cutoffs, but this is what we use here. So over 30 is considered obese and there's different levels of that. I'm just gonna report the main one. 25 to 29.9 is considered overweight, 18.5 to 24.9 is considered normal, and less than 18.5 is considered underweight. Like I said, it's based simply on this ratio without taking anything else into account for the most part. The majority of doctors, majority of healthcare people, fitness professionals, personal trainers, all these things for the most part are just gonna be looking at this number apps on your phone, okay? Like it's everywhere. You can calculate your BMI so easily. One study said that it is estimated that 31% of the population may be misidentified when BMI is used as a proxy for health, meaning that there's people that are in that quote normal range that they may have metabolic dysfunction, okay? So they may have high cholesterol, they may have high blood pressure, Obviously, we know people like that, right? And then there's gonna be people in the so-called overweight or obese category that don't have any of that stuff. They have more fat on their body, maybe, although I'm not gonna, I'd love to do a deep dive on the BMI sometime. I'm not, that wasn't the intention of this episode, but there's a lot of things we can say about the BMI. Because the BMI is simply a ratio of weight over height squared, obviously if you're a bodybuilder and you have a ton of muscle, your BMI might be high. But that's not the majority of people because the majority of people aren't bodybuilders, okay? So I'm not making the argument that we gotta throw BMI out because of that. But as you can see, it's not a specific thing. It's just a simple ratio, okay? And this study said 31% of people, one third of the population is gonna be misclassified because of that. So we have to really take that into account when we're thinking about BMI. I wanna take a moment to give you a point of clarification on the word fat. For the most part, the word fat in regards to talking to our bodies has a negative connotation. So we've said to ourselves growing up or still currently some people probably do this to themselves, I'm so fat or speaking in a negative way. So this, this word of like, this person is fat or I'm fat has been stigmatized. It carries that stigma, right? However, there is a growing group of people that are trying to reclaim this word and destigmatize it. So the use of the term fat as an identity descriptor is being used increasingly by researchers and activists as a way to reclaim power, reduce shame and stigma of the word, and also as a form of protest, okay? So you're going to see people refer to themselves, their identity as fat or a fat whatever, you know? And I see it almost as what pronouns people are comfortable or want for themselves, you know? Like if a person wants to identify that way, then that's their choice and it also helps us normalize the term and destigmatize the term. I'm not, I don't love the term just because I feel like it's not, it's hard for me to explain, but basically there's a lot of people that don't have a larger body that are also fat, okay? Like their body, their body fat percentage might be super high. I am one of those people. I am technically, like I'm right above, I'm technically overweight if you look at the categories because I'm like 25.6 on my BMI. And my body fat percentage is near 40. So I store a lot of fat. I'm also very high in muscle, I have both. 
but and most people that are larger body have more lean muscle than people who are smaller body because they are using that muscle to carry the extra weight around so they actually have higher lean muscle and also higher body fat so i just think referring to fatness is not necessarily accurate you know um but if people want to be want to identify with that then that's great and then we need to accept it and respect it and also just know that the term fat shouldn't carry stigma with it if you know we have it or we identify with it another option and what i use because i'm not comfortable calling people fat just because i mean come on i'm just going to be going around like testing people's body fat percentage i mean and that's arbitrary too. So we can talk about how arbitrary all of this is in general. But another option is to use person first language, saying a person with a larger body. So that's generally what I use. And when I refer to people with larger bodies, we're talking about people that are beyond this norm of this bell curve that is obviously skewed to the right. And so that's a little bit of semantics there, but as you explore more and you're seeing this community you're going to be seeing the word fat more at the beginning it's probably going to be uncomfortable it's going to feel weird because we're used to using fat as an insult you know what i'm saying so just be aware of that and i wanted to clarify that in case you weren't familiar with the way that that's being used and i also think just like pronouns like i said before if somebody wants to be wants to identify with fat that's great but i think i wouldn't just go around especially if you're not a person with a larger body calling people fat thinking that you're going to destigmatize it because the majority of people still have weight and size bias and have internalized bias which i'm going to describe in a little bit okay so let's move on that was a big segue let's move on to weight stigma so weight stigma, also known as size stigma, weight bias, weight discrimination, weight prejudice, fat phobia, and sizeism. So these are all terms that mean basically the same thing. It refers to the labeling, stereotyping, separation, and discrimination of individuals, populations, and organizations on the basis of weight or size. Stigma is a physical characteristic or character trait that marks the bear as having a lower social value. And here we're specifically referring to people that have a larger than average body size. Common stereotypes and where, what it means to have this stigma, usually people carry these stereotypes, right? When they have this bias. So the common stereotypes are that people with larger bodies are lazy, weak-willed, unsuccessful, unintelligent, lack self-discipline, have poor willpower, and are non-compliant with treatment. Surprisingly and shockingly, these beliefs have been reported by people as young as three years old. So remember when I talked to you earlier about social conditioning and how we're born into this a lot of times, just like we're born into racism and all kinds of other isms. The size bias, the weight stigma is strong and it starts young, young, young. Weight stigma is highly prevalent, like I said before, and it's increasing, increasing big time over time. Between 1995 and 2006, it increased 66%. Now weight stigma is comparable to rates of racial discrimination in America. Why do we do it? Why has this happened? Why does it feel so natural? One of the reasons is that there is a widespread belief that if we shame people or make them feel bad about their size, it will motivate them. We have those same beliefs for a lot of things like addiction and things like that too. So it's not just size, but we think, hey, just this person's probably not aware that they have a larger body and we should tell them that they need to be smaller in order to be better <laughs> you know what i'm saying so weight stigmatization is often justified as a way to motivate individuals to adopt healthier behaviors but the foundational belief that we all have to have is that a person's weight is within their personal control if we didn't believe that we wouldn't 
do anything because we didn't think it could change anything, right? So we have to believe that this person has the capacity to change it. But ironically, we believe this especially for people in larger bodies. We treat people in larger bodies differently from people that are not in larger bodies. We believe that they cause their bodies to be a certain size, so they should want to and should be able to make their bodies smaller. So this is central to our common weight-centric approach in the United States. One research study was able to synthesize the weight-centric approach down to six core beliefs. So this they called the six tenets of a weight-centric approach, and I wanted to share this with you because it is so true, and I want you to really think about it, and every time you're reading something or judging something about weight, think about these tenets, okay? Number one, weight gain is under individual control. Number two, weight gain is caused by an imbalance in caloric intake and energy balance. Number three, health status can be predicted by weight. Number four, excess weight causes disease and early death. Number five, methods for successful long-term weight loss involve modification in eating and exercise patterns. And number six, losing weight will result in better health. Okay, so these are the beliefs that are core, that are necessary for this weight-centric approach, which is the common approach in our country. So let's talk about social media for a sec because it is a big deal when it comes to weight stigma. It is estimated that there are now 4.62 billion people that use social media, 4.62 billion, okay? That's over half of the world. Social media may have both negative and positive influences on weight stigma, but I feel that the majority of people, they're gonna be doing the negative influences because they're not gonna be out there deliberately trying to curate this feed that gives them the positive benefits of social media when it comes to size and weight. They have found that the majority of comments directed towards individuals in larger bodies on social media expressed negative sentiment. And a study on YouTube showed that attacks on individuals of higher weight were twice as frequent as comments in their defense. And as you can see, if you're on social media, your feed is going to be filled with pictures of these lean, beautiful people that look perfect, that are eating their you know, salads and green juices, especially if you're in the health community and you follow a lot of the health influencers. I'm not saying that they're bad. None of this is bad. It's just the way it is and we have to be aware of it, okay? So your feed is going to look like not the average America, okay? And maybe you're aware of that, but most people probably aren't aware of that because your brain starts to accept that this is the reality and this is the way it should be and this is the way I should be. The brain automatically starts to compare, okay? So that comparison can lead to body dissatisfaction. It can lead to dieting, and then subsequent binging and all of those things. In the next episode that I do on this topic, I'll talk more about that, about our ideals and comparison and all of that. But let's move on to medical weight bias. So what is medical weight bias? It is weight or size bias within the healthcare setting that can affect the medical treatment of an individual. Unfortunately, doctors are one of the most common interpersonal sources of weight stigma. They experience both implicit and explicit weight bias at the same rates as a general population. But really, if I had to guess, I think doctors probably have more bias, honestly, because we're immersed in this health world that says this BMI is bad and this BMI is good and we have to do it all the time and insurance companies force us to talk about it, otherwise you don't get reimbursed. So I feel that doctors probably have more weight bias than the average citizen out there. And I want to also differentiate between implicit and explicit bias, just so that you know what that means. So implicit bias means that you are unaware. It is unconscious 
unconscious bias. Explicit bias means that you are purposely doing this thing so you're aware of it, okay? So implicit and explicit. Patients with higher internalized weight bias, and I'm gonna tell you what that is in the next definition, are more likely to avoid healthcare, are likely to experience more judgment from their doctors and report less frequent listening and respect from their providers, as well as lower quality healthcare. These doctors that have this bias are likely to engage in less patient-centered conversations with people in larger bodies because they believe that they're lazy, undisciplined, weak-willed, have less respect for people in larger bodies, and may spend less time educating people about their health, may over-attribute symptoms to problems with body size, and are less likely to refer or prescribe medications beyond advising weight loss. This is so common, and me working with clients and talking with people that have larger bodies, this happens all the time. And what happens when doctors are biased in this way, and it doesn't mean a person is bad because it's a bias, and a lot of the times it's implicit, right? So you don't even realize you have it. But what happens is that you discount symptoms and you say, well, that's obviously just because you're too large. So your knee pain is because you're too large. So there's so many stories of patients that were told, just go lose weight, go lose weight, go lose weight. They had massive tumors. They had real medical problems that could have been addressed earlier had, so that they could have less pain and better quality of life. So this bias hurts patients. But I'll take it a step further and say that it hurts every patient, whether they're in a larger body or in an average size or lean body. And the reason is, is because the bias goes both ways. A doctor may assume that a person with a larger body has all these health problems because of their weight, so you just need to lose weight. But then a person with a leaner body, they may not even think that that person could have a health problem because they look naturally lean and we associate smaller body size with health. And that is just not true some of the time, okay? So there's a lot of people that are healthy, whether they're average lean body size or larger body size. And there's people that have health problems, whether they're larger bodied or they're leaner bodied, okay? So whenever we have this bias, we can start misdiagnosing people because we are judging them based on their body size or not asking the right questions, not ordering the right tests, not referring because we're like, oh, you just need to lose weight or, oh, you look lean and athletic. We don't need to do that test. And if you're in my email newsletter, I did send in one of my newsletters where I confessed about how I myself got trapped into that bias thinking that my patients probably didn't have high cholesterol because I generally have a lean, very healthy, health conscious group that I work with at my clinic. So I wasn't doing some of the surveillance that's recommended early in a child's life. That bit me in the butt hard. Okay, that is bias and it can affect patients whether they're larger or leaner bodied, but people with leaner or people with larger bodies are suffering, suffering and suffering really hard because of the size of their bodies, okay? People with higher BMIs are three times as likely as people with normal BMIs to say that they have been denied appropriate medical care. People that feel stigmatized are less likely to seek medical care or de delay seeking medical care because they fear they will not be treated well. I've said this on the podcast before, but they did one study of women that 30% of the women in that group that they surveyed had either avoided or delayed medical care because of their weight, because they were afraid that they were gonna go, that they were gonna be lectured to lose weight, but they had some other medical problem that they needed addressed, okay? so. Can you just see like how this is just like this vicious cycle of we keep telling people that are larger bodied, you're so unhealthy, you need to lose weight and they become unhealthier because of our bias. They may not even have been that unhealthy to begin with, but because of this bias, now they're not getting diagnosed, they're not getting treated. And so, yeah, now it's like the self-fulfilling prophecy of all of these people with larger bodies will be unhealthy because they can't even get proper medical care. As you can see, I'm very passionate about this and I get a little angry, okay? 
So that's something to be aware of. And we have to remember that when these studies are done that are associating body size with health problems, there is a big amount of stigma there that is affecting their health and their health care. We have to remember that. We must remember that. And as we start to destigmatize body size and focus more on well being, which I'll talk about in the follow up episode of this, I think we can start to turn this around so that everybody can start to pursue the well being that they desire. Let's talk about internalized weight bias. So, internalized weight bias, internalized weight stigma. This is, quote, applying negative weight stereotypes to oneself and engaging in self-devaluation based on one's weight. Individuals who experience weight stigma are more likely to develop internalized weight bias. Okay, so basically what this means is that you've become brainwashed by society. If you are a person with a larger body, you will also start to believe that you are bad and unhealthy and in need to lose weight. And you believe that wholeheartedly, you believe that for yourself and anybody else with a larger body, okay? So basically, it's like, it's so horrible and cruel, right? Like there's this group of people that are telling you that you're bad, they say it enough that you start to believe them and then join in with them in the fight against you. So as you can see, that it's, it's just like all very twisted and deep and it becomes this vicious cycle. And there's a lot of people that have internalized weight bias, okay? And so, and this internalized weight bias goes deep and I'm one of those people because I started dieting when I was nine years old. So three decades of yo-yo dieting, being very dissatisfied with my body and thinking that my solution to all my problems in my life is, would be to have a thinner body. Okay, so that is internalized weight bias as well. And I'm not even a person that has a larger than average body size. So there's a lot of people that have this weight bias, internalized weight bias, not just weight bias, but internalized weight bias of all body sizes. Thin privilege. So I want to talk about thin privilege as a form of privilege. This is a quote by Christy Harrison, who is the author of a book called Anti Diet. So she says, quote, thin privilege actually just means that by virtue of some characteristic of your body, in this case, being below a certain size, you have greater access to resources and face less discrimination in society than people without that characteristic, end quote. So privilege, like when I, when we talk about privilege, a lot of people get defensive and me included, okay? Because all of a sudden you feel attacked and like you should feel bad about yourself, but it's not... It's not to feel bad about yourself, it's to become aware. Because for the most part, privilege is invisible. You are often born into privilege, and especially if your body size is lean and you've been lean your whole life, you may not know the difference because that's how it's been, so it just feels like normal life to you, okay? The other thing that's really, really important that Christy pointed out in this blog post that I read is to remember that the majority of people are unhappy with their bodies. So thin privilege does not mean that you feel thin or that you like your body. You may feel that you need to lose weight. You may feel that you need to be thinner and still have thin privilege. It's all more of a relative thing, right? So if you are, in this normotypical within this bell curve that we currently have, and you're in the normal typical body size, you don't wear plus sizes, you have thin privilege. And it doesn't mean you're bad, it's just being aware. And it's not, like I said, necessarily something that you have been aware of or feel because it's invisible to you. But people in larger bodies feel the stigma of not having thin privilege, right? And also, you can probably find people that used to have a larger body that now, through weight loss measures or whatever happened to them, they became smaller, leaner, and they experienced the shocking, stark contrast 
of thin privilege. I've read lots of these stories and it's hard for people. It's really hard for people when they experience this because they realized that they were not imagining things. And now I feel like crying because I just can't imagine having that experience of all of a sudden you are in a smaller body and people are doing all this stuff for you that they never did before, you know? And yeah, that probably feels good in some ways. And you're like, oh yes, I finally get this, what I want. But at the same time, you realize it had nothing to do with me as a person, but I was being judged solely by the size of my body. And of course this happens in so many different ways, right? Like our skin color, our socioeconomic status, all of these things, we can get judged by this cover and treat a certain way. But having that stark contrast for some people can be so shocking. And so look up some of those stories so that you can see firsthand the experiences that people have had where they have been in a larger body and then a smaller body and they feel that difference. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about how weight stigma and discrimination affect body size. And I can't believe I've been talking for 47 minutes. That is why I had to cut this in half because I knew that if I didn't, I would be talking forever. But now we're getting into like the really important part and then I'll finish off with what you can do, the eight things you can do, okay? So as you can see, people in larger bodies face immense stigma. It's very prevalent, it's pervasive, it affects the people they trust the most like you know, people out in the world that they respect, but they're physicians and healthcare providers, okay? So it's all around. And it's stressful. Studies have found that weight stigma, weight discrimination leads to elevated cortisol levels. They have been able to directly measure this. Your stress hormones increase based upon the amount of stigma you are perceiving. People that experience weight stigma are more likely to have mood disorders such as anxiety, depression, body image dissatisfaction, and negative self-esteem. People that perceive weight stigma are also likely to avoid exercise, have maladaptive eating, meaning disordered eating, like binge eating, those kinds of things, increased calorie intake, and increased likelihood of binge eating, okay? So does this make sense to you? If you're really stressed out because people are treating you badly because of the size of your body, does it make sense to you that you might cope with something that you already have available to you, like food? I mean, it makes sense to me because that's one of my favorite coping mechanisms is eating. I've been able to unlearn that habit more and more over the past few years, but that used to be my number one way. Like I was the only method I had to cope. And for some people, it may still be, it's very common. It's a very co common coping mechanism for people in all body sizes. It just happens that for these people that experience weight stigma, they do the same. So youth are exposed, youth that are exposed to weight stigma are more likely to binge eat and also engage in less physical activity. Weight stigma is significantly associated with greater disordered eating, sleep disturbance, and alcohol use, even after controlling for BMI, okay? So this is so important because people might say, well, yeah, if you're bigger, then obviously that's the way you are because we have all these stereotypes, right? So you're gonna eat more and you're not gonna exercise, but they have found these associations even controlling for BMI, meaning that there's people that might be within this normal curve, but if they perceive that they're being stigmatized for their weight, they develop these behaviors, meaning that the behaviors are developing likely from a stress response due to the stigma, the discrimination. Okay, there's no gender differences in these findings which is important to know too. So we, as a woman, I always think about other women because I am a woman and having body image issues and experiencing stigma, but it happens to men as well. So we can't leave them out of this, this discussion. What's really heartbreaking is that people who reported experiencing weight discrimination had a 60% increase, increase, had a 60% increased chance of dying independent of BMI, independent of BMI, 
okay? So this is controlling for the actual size of their body. Those that experience weight discrimination had a 60% increased chance of dying, which is why weight discrimination is literally deadly. The mere perception of being overweight, even, even among those with a quote, normal body mass index, is prospectively associated with unhealthy blood pressure, CRP, which is an inflammatory marker in our blood, cholesterol, and blood sugar levels. So even with those people that have normal BMIs, if they are perceived to be overweight, like they think themselves that they're overweight. So they have this internalized stigma. They have this internalized bias. They begin to have these health problems. People that perceive weight stigma are more likely to gain weight and have increased weight circumference over time. And back to the social media, when we talk about weight stigma and weight discrimination, when we are exposed to thin idealizing ads, it results in greater dislike of people that are above a certain body size, which I'm gonna put in quotes, overweight and obesity. So when we're exposed to these ads that show lean people, which is like all the ads pretty much, right? We start thinking that people in larger body size, they're not in that category. So we start to dislike them already and that's probably implicit. Like you're not thinking in your head, oh, I don't like people that are large. It's just this thing that you're starting to associate. And also exposure to these thin idealizing ads creates lower body satisfaction in body and weight, body shape and weight for people that are watching the ads, okay? So it's affecting you negatively regardless. It's making you more biased and it's making you feel bad about yourself. So it's one of those things that I'll address in a second. Now, what's really interesting is that I found out this stat about federally protected categories in the UK and in the US and weight is not a federally protected characteristic in fair employment laws. People with larger bodies are more likely to face employment discrimination based on body size. Women with larger bodies are paid less on average. And then what is particularly disconcerting is that there's a greater percentage of people with larger bodies in already marginalized groups, such as ethnic, racial groups, socioeconomic status, immigrant status, meaning that they may face multiple stigmas on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you can imagine an economically disadvantaged immigrant woman of color who's a single mother and also has a larger body size, Imagine how many levels of stigma that person faces and how much stress and cortisol they're experiencing just trying to move through their life on a day-to-day -day basis. And in the next, the follow-up episode, I'll talk about food insecurity and some of the very interesting correlations with food insecurity. So that stress level is probably really high, which is increasing the risk for all of these other health problems, blood pressure, cholesterol, blood sugar levels, all of these things. Okay, whew, okay, that was a lot. How are you feeling? Take a deep breath, I'm gonna take a deep breath. <sighs> okay, let's center ourselves and let's talk about what are the things we can do. There are things that you can do starting right now, starting today. So I'm gonna give you eight suggestions for how you can be part of the movement to destigmatize body size so that we can start to normalize different body shapes and sizes and cause less harm to our fellow human beings. Okay, so what can you do as an individual? Number one, acknowledge and become aware of your weight and size bias. That's number one the first thing we need to do. And know that because there's a lot of our biases that are implicit, they're subconscious, you're not gonna be aware of it right away. So really thinking about things, really noticing how and why you do things, the little subconscious things that are happening in your brain when you're looking in social media, et cetera. So first acknowledge that you have bias. Yes, we all have it. Don't feel ashamed, it's just part of life. And then, become aware of these biases. Number two, 
Stop commenting on and referring to people's body size. This takes practice. It's not easy because one of the ways that we congratulate people is by telling them, oh my gosh, you look so good. Have you lost weight? You know, what are you doing? You look so trim, you know, like, so this is rewarding. It's like feeding into the machine, right? Like, you know, when I talk about uh, watering the flowers and not the weeds, well, you know, we're like watering, we're giving more umph, we're giving, you know, that support and encouragement to the weight bias when we do that, okay? Number three, stop assuming that people should or want to lose weight. We're gonna talk about healthism in the next follow-up episode. I keep saying next episode, but it's not the next episode. It's gonna be a few episodes down the line. Healthism is when we start connecting people's worth to their health. And so don't assume that everybody should or wants to work on their health. I know that's hard to accept. And not everybody wants to change their body size or maybe they've already tried and they're sick of it and they're done with that, okay? So that's an assumption we should stop and stop asking people to do. And really just remember, it's none of your business. It's their body, okay? So I don't wanna sound like blunt or mean or anything, but it's just true. Number four, stop judging health based on size. This one also takes practice because it is so ingrained, right? We see a person, they might be larger body, and we're like, oh my God, oh my God, they're going to have a heart attack. Okay, this is a belief that is deeply ingrained and it's supported over and over again in the media and social media by our friends and family. So catch yourself when you're having that thought, especially if you're saying it out loud, especially if you're saying it out loud around your kids. Please, let's stop, stop the cycle now and help raise a generation of people that don't have this strong weight and size bias and healthism. Number five, stop medicalizing body size, which is why I have been training myself to stop using the terms overweight and obese because it's just based on this number, okay? I'd rather talk about a person's habits and behaviors, and if we do labs, whether they have high cholesterol, they have high blood pressure, they have high glucose, these are objective truths from that individual. It's not based upon this calculation. So really the other health characteristics are more important because we can target those. We can do things for that. We can change habits and behaviors. We can move more. We can eat more fruits and vegetables. We can give medication if we need to for some conditions, okay? So let's stop medicalizing body size. This is to everybody, but especially my healthcare providers out there. I know this is hard. I, I mean, this, this is not black or white, but we need to have discussions about this, okay? Six, redirect and interrupt conversations that focus on body size and or dieting. I've talked about this before. It's called fat talk. So whenever everybody's sitting around, oh my God, I'm going on spring break. Oh, I just, I'm so fat. My stomach is so big and I need to, I just need to go on a fast. You know, ladies, I'm going to go on this five day fast. Change the subject. Say like, oh, hey, are y'all's kids playing soccer? Or um, why don't we, let, let's go for a walk or let's do, you know, just interrupt, <laughs> change the subject. Let's start redirecting this. Or even if you're close with these friends, be like, hey, can we stop talking about diets? Can we stop talking about body size? I I'm trying to learn a new way to approach life and I've come aware of you know these biases that we all have and I'd love it if we just kind of not talk about this stuff. You know, If you're close to somebody, you can have that conversation. It's uncomfortable because Honestly, let me just tell you that my number one habit for a long time in life was going on a diet. Like it was like my favorite thing. Um, and I wanted to talk about it all the time because as you can see, I love talking. So whatever I'm doing, I want to talk about it. So I was probably like the number one fat talk diet talker in the world. So that took me a lot to unlearn that. And it took me a lot to unlearn referring to people's body size, and I'm not perfect, and you're not gonna be perfect either, but let's practice it, okay? Number seven, avoid the terms overweight and obesity. And this one's gonna be hard, and maybe you don't agree with me, but that's what I'm doing. Because remember, it's based upon a simple calculation, and 31% of people, I mean, it's meaningless. What does it mean? What does it mean, okay? 
So let's just stop using it. Maybe if you're a doctor and you're not, uh, not comfortable stopping using it, everybody else should because we're the rest of us, if we're not acting as doctors, we don't need to be using it. <sighs> okay, last one. <laughs> Follow fat activists, uh, body liberationists on social media and diversify the body sizes in your feed. So purposely start looking for people to follow that you're going to see a representation of real, actual people living life in this world. You're, and you know, I encourage this for different ethnic groups, different skin colors, because it helps us see the reality of our world we're less likely to have this stark difference in comparison that is going to make you unhappy and make you feel bad about yourself, but also is going to reinforce your bias, okay? So this is the part where you have to be deliberate about social media. Another option is just to get off of social media. For some of us, that's not possible because it may be part of our careers and what we do or whatever. But for others, especially if you struggle with your body image, especially if you're really concerned about these issues, take a break and see how you feel when you're not on social media. Do you feel better about yourself? Are you able to make choices that are aligned with sustainable habits that support your well-being instead of feeling like some external thing because you feel like you need to control your weight. Okay, so those are the eight things. Let me say them again. One, become aware of and become aware of and acknowledge your weight bias. Number two, stop commenting on referring to people's body size. Number three, stop assuming people should or want to lose weight. Number four, stop judging health based on body size. Number five, stop medicalizing body size. Number six, redirect and interrupt conversations that focus on body size and or dieting. Number seven, avoid terms like overweight and obesity that categorize people based upon their body size and medicalize their body size. Number eight, follow fat activists, body liberationists, diversify your social media feed. I'm gonna leave you with a few resources. There is a book called Body of Truth by Harriet Brown. I did a podcast episode with Harriet. It was great. I cannot remember the number, but we'll link it below. But the book is really great. Body of Truth also goes into some of these things like BMI and all of that stuff. I found one vegan fat activist that identifies as a fat activist. The account is at Fat Vegan Voice. I did not write down their name. That is my mistake, but we will link it in the show notes as well. So if you want to follow them and then there's some organizations that you might want to look into association for size, diversity, and health national association to advance fat acceptance and council on size and weight discrimination. So these are organizations that are actively working on these issues when it comes to weight discrimination, size bias, etc. And finally, there is a psychological test that I recommend you take. I was surprised by my results, but then I realized I shouldn't have been surprised because we have, we all have implicit biases we're not aware of, okay? So this test is called the Harvard University Implicit Attitudes Test on Weight Bias. The Harvard University Implicit Attitudes Test on Weight Bias. And it is like a classical psychological test where you're like pairing things. It's really cool. But we'll put the link to it. If you have time, it takes around 10-ish, maybe 15 minutes at the most, probably around 10 minutes. And then it'll give you results and compare you to everybody else that's taken the test. And it's really cool. So we'll link that in the show notes. I will link all the articles that I used to create this episode today so that you can read them yourself because there's a lot more details. And I have gone over an hour and I could go more. But there'd be an, there'll be another follow-up episode where I'll discuss some more topics that are relevant to this. I appreciate you. Happy 200 episodes. Like I said, please share this episode with two people. If you want to give me a little gift, I would appreciate it. And if you're curious about doing one-on-one -on -one coaching, go to dryami.com spelled out forward slash coach me. Thank you, veggie lovers, for hanging in there with me. I hope that this was educational, 
And I hope that you're feeling empowered and that you have some things that you can do. If you like this episode, I want to know if you have ideas for other episodes, please reach out. Thank you so much and have a very plantastic day. Hey, veggie lover. I hope that you loved today's episode. Will you take a second and do me a huge favor? Please subscribe to my podcast so that you never miss an episode. You're the reason I'm here and I want to share it all with you. Thank you for listening and have a plantastic day.